the letter of Ephesians, chapter 4. And we are going to begin at verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. When you get there, say, oh yeah. All right, there we go. And this is what Paul wrote to the church. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all the uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he, he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Paul. We thank you for how the Holy Spirit protected him and guided him, Lord, and how he gave us so much wisdom in this one moment. Uh, Father, we pray for your church this morning. Lord, everyone who's here, there's no one here by accident or happenstance. We're all here for your divine appointed moment as you wish to talk to us. Lord, move my flesh aside. Let the very spirit of Jesus minister every heart and mind here. God, that we may know that we were with you and you are with us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. It says in the book of Psalms, twice. It says in Psalms 14, verse 1, and Psalms 53, verse 1, for fools say in their heart, there is no God. I believe that, and I want to tell you that I was one of those fools at one point in my life. Fools say in their heart, there is no God. Creation demands that there's a creator, a God. I think one of the things that even make us question the existence of God, I think one of the chief things is because of all the suffering and pain and evil that we see in this world that really impacts us, hurts people we love, destroys families, destroys people, destroys lives, all these, this chaos around us. We look at this and, and the best one to blame is who? Well, God. We will lift up and we'll blame God. But here's the thing. I've never seen God do anything bad, but I've seen a lot of people do a lot of bad. Amen. You see, when it says this, a fool says in his heart, there is no God, because it says after this, they are corrupt doing bad deeds. There is no one who does good. That's how the, the full verse goes. And so I really thought about this. I, I think... Uh, it's a poor question to think, is there a God? I think there are better questions we can ask so that we can better understand life and ourselves. I think would be a good question is, why are we so bad? Why are we so evil? 
Why, why isn't it like you've never had to teach a kid to do bad? Amen? You just don't. It just comes natural. I remember distinctly in points in my life when I was a child, I just knew how to do bad. I was like about 10 and my mom asked me to vacuum the living room, which was the worst thing in the world you could possibly do when you're 10 years old, right? And I'm kind of bitter and angry because there's my sister. She's like two and a half years younger than me and she's not vacuuming, right? She's just laid across the couch watching me vacuum. And then there's something inside of me said, hey, Chris. See if some of her hair can go in that vacuum, you know? And I was like, oh, I better not. And then something else inside of me was like, no, go ahead. Just, let's just see what happens, right? And so she's just sitting there watching cartoons, and I'm sitting there vacuuming, and I'm getting closer and closer to her and closer. And then all of a sudden, it just started the raise on its own. And uh, <laughs> it started the guide near, and it's getting closer and closer, and then her little hair is beginning to kind of flutter right near it. And then some went in. And then a lot more went in. And then like went up to her head. It was like, clunk. <laughs> and then there was this loud scream. And there was chaos. And there were things said. And I uh, had a rough day. <laughs> you know? If you're just like, you've had a rough day. And the only one that you can blame really is everyone else. You can say, well, she didn't have to be laying there. Why would she have to have long hair? Uh, it's your fault because you asked me to vacuum. We can blame everybody in the world, and if we ran, run out of people to blame, we'll blame God. We'll say, well, God, I guess you just shouldn't have made me. Right? When really, our problem comes from here. You don't have to tell me that there's evil in the world. Evil is all around us. You see, the belief in God creates this mentality that there is good too. And that good is greater than evil. Because here's the thing, natural person just does bad. And if you look at like chaos, like the, uh, just the natural kingdom, nature, it's kind of rough. I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched how animals treat each other, but it's pretty, it's pretty violent. It's pretty bad. And you, you don't see, like, some of these uh, killer whales, you know? I was watching, uh, my, my daughter was watching these old VHS tapes of uh, Nature Kingdom or whatever it was back in the day, and there was one segment on killer whales, and they were, uh, they were going and they were catching seals and bringing them out to, in the middle of the ocean and just throwing them up in the air. And they'd just fall, and, and they'd try to get away, and the killer whale would and throw it up in the air. And I'm like, my daughter's watching this. But here's the thing. Animals do what animals what? Do. It's their nature. You don't see a single killer whale saying, you know what, I just really want to stop throwing seals up in the air. I really feel that's wrong and I shouldn't do it anymore. You will not see like a lion call a hotline and say, you know what, I'm really tired of eating these gazelles and these zebras. You know, I feel bad about it. But what you do see is a difference in us when it comes to nature. Because we will actually choose to harm or to help. To give or to steal. We choose that. It's not ingrained in our nature to be bad. We actually have this concept and this thought that, you know what, I could do better and I could do good. And that small sliver of a point is the image of God. Because we were created in God's image. We were. That's why we're very unique from all the other animals, everything in the nature. We are so unique because we were created in the image of God. But, but listen to this. Sin has fractured and broken that image. And that is where all evil and all war and all hatred comes from. And listen, if you, you buy into this idea of evolution, why haven't we evolved into peace. Why haven't we evolved past all these baser instincts to hurt and to steal and to kill and destroy and to lie? Why haven't we evolved out of that? Because we, had, we were evolved. We were designed and made. We are the image of God and God planned something much greater for us than what we're running around doing. I just believe that maybe there's so much bad in the world is because we don't really understand who God is 
made us to be. Who Jesus came and lived and died and raised again for us to be. And the Apostle Paul answers these questions. He answers why there is evil. He answers why we can be different. He addresses these questions. What does it mean to be in this world, but not of this world? What does it mean to be a new creation? What does it mean to be a new person? What does it mean? Paul answers these questions right here. And I think many Christians, we struggle with this idea because we come to know Jesus and then we wake up the next morning and we're like, oh man, I'm still the same person. I still have this weight in my stomach. I still don't have no hair. Things haven't changed. Why, why has things changed? You roll over and you're married to the same person. I thought I accepted Jesus and all my life was supposed to change. It did change. I think that we're really obsessed with how we want our lives to change. And we fail to realize and to understand how Christ wishes to change us. Who he wants us to be. What he's called us to be. It's so rich and beautiful. And I love this opening passage here because it really tackles who we are before Jesus Christ. Paul is writing it in distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Because Jews, they grew up with a sense of the law. They at least had this moral code. Gentiles did not have this moral code. And so when we read through this first passage, you'll really see that and understand it. Look at these verses 17 through 19 again. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind or vanity, having their understanding, what does it say there? Darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. I love how it keeps going back to this idea of darkness and this idea of unclarity. Uh, several years ago, well, I say several, actually about three years ago, uh, had a guy come through CLM, actually. His name is Michael Sawyer. And one of the first times he came, he came and he filled out a visitor's card. And he, like, checked almost every box you could check, you know. And he had a young son who was uh, about three or four at the time. And he came up and we prayed. And he was just so on, he wanted to know, know more and more about Jesus. Because for the first time in his life, he started to realize that he didn't have to live like he'd been living for so long. Because everything around him, his environment, his friends, were in darkness. And listen, when he finally got to see light, when he finally got to see love, when he finally got to see brotherhood, it, it changed his life completely. He, he's, he wanted more and more and more of this. You know, it's incredibly hard to let the old person die and let the new person thrive. Three months after he gave me his visitor's card, he died on Highway 78. Because the old man came back. But I really feel like Jesus had other plans for him. I feel in my heart. So I always keep this in my Bible when I'm turning through it. Because, listen, those of you who have accepted Jesus and you're walking this new life, that old man wants to bring you back to where you were. And Christ Jesus redeemed you from it. You don't have to go back. You don't have to look back. Keep pressing forward. You see, Jesus wishes not just to change your environment. Jesus wishes to change your inner being. That you're completely different. And I know a lot of us, we really don't understand before Jesus where we were because we're just encased in darkness and we can't see. Matter of fact, that word blindness can also be translated hardness of heart. Any of y'all got calluses on your hands and stuff? It's so, it's so neat. This is almost the same application here that life and the world and sin create calluses almost on your heart. And so what we try to do is when brokenness shows up, we try to fix ourselves. And so if you've ever broken a bone, have you ever tried to fix a broken bone yourself? You shouldn't do that. Amen? Because it could grow what? Crooked. And then your arm will be going like a really weird way, right? 
you shouldn't fix your bone on your own, but listen, uh, if you break it and refix it, break it and refix it, break it and refix it, after a while you're going to have this huge callus on your bone because it's fixing itself. You know what Jesus wants to do is just to break that bone clean and strip off all that extra stuff, all the dead stuff, and have it heal right and strong. That's what God really wants us to do. But we have this cycle in our lives. It's called uh, a cycle of death. I'm sorry, I don't want to shock anybody, but we're all going to, you know, we're all going to go one day. We are. And listen, but the world kills us in different ways. And you don't know it because you might be in it, and you don't realize it. One of my favorite things to tell is I went on a royal ambassador's journey one time, a camping trip. If you don't, want to know, if you don't know what royal ambassadors are, there are little kids' ministry for boys between ages uh, 5 and 11 or 12. That's a rough age, especially if you take like 20 of them camping. That's really, really rough. And so, matter of fact, J Justin was one of them, actually. Justin's all grown up now, but he was one of them. And I had a tent, and I was crammed in a tent with like three or four boys. It was awful. And I don't know why, but every time you go camping, it always rains. Have you ever noticed that? Well, every time you go camping, it rains. And you tell the kids, don't touch the tent. Because when you touch the tent and it's raining, water starts to seep in. It's just like science and stuff, you know? You just don't touch the tent when it's raining. And they're like, oh, you know. And there was rain getting in there, and it was hot, and it was, it was awful. But you know what? I didn't really know how bad it was until... About two or three in the morning, I had to get out of there, and I unzipped the tent, and this fresh air hit me, and it felt oh, so wonderful. I was like, I breathed all of it in, and then I got on, and I zipped it back up, and I was like, oh man, it feels so much better. It was still raining, but I didn't care, because I had freedom. I could move my limbs and arms. I was breathing fresh air, and then I had to go back to the tent, and when I got there, I had this hesitation. I was like, no, I can't leave the kids. So I, zip, I unzip the tent, and this foul odor hits my face. <laughs> and I, it's undescribable. It really is. It's like between corn chips and sadness. You know, I, I don't know. You know, it's just the awful smell, and it's, it hits you, and you're just thinking, I've got to go back into that. And I'd already been in there, and I don't know how many brain cells have died because I was already in there for a long amount of time. I don't think we really realize how bad we are in it until we get out of it. I don't think many of us understand how dark and sinful and hurtful and broken you are until you get out of it. And Jesus says, you don't have to live like that anymore. I have something much greater for you because I wish to make you a new person, a living new being. And the old man is dead and behold, the new one is here. I don't know if you've ever heard like testimonies and I've been to testimony services at church and like one guy will stand up and he'll say all the bad things he ever did in life. And then the next guy will stand up and goes, well, brother, I got something better for you. And he says like well, even worse things. And listen, I was like 12 or 13 when I was hearing this. Like, oh my goodness, these are church men. And then the third guy get up, he did even worse. But here's the thing. They never said what happened after Christ. You see, that's a testimony. Not just what God brought you from, but what Jesus has led you to. Because he equips you for service. And he sends you out to do his work on this earth. Because we live in an evil, dark place. And people cry out, why doesn't God do anything? Listen, that's why God raised up the church. He has called us to go and make the difference because we are the new creations in Christ Jesus. But look at what it says in verses 20 through 24. It says, but you have not to learn Christ. If indeed you have heard him, you've also been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you've put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitfulness of lusts and be renewed in the spirit by your mind and that you put on who? The new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Listen, truth dwells in Jesus. Truth must dwell in God's people. 
If you have Jesus, you have truth. If you have Jesus, you have his spirit. And so where you go, his spirit and truth should go as well. Amen? That's, that's how it should be. Uh, I, I remember uh, one, of, one of the men here telling me a little bit after he got saved, and God saved him from alcoholism, that he was outside cutting grass. And as, as he's cutting grass, and he got a freedom from his addiction, and they give him a new life, and he's sitting there cutting grass, it was hot. And all of a sudden, this, this uh, thought popped in his head, a nice cold beer would be good right about now. Just at that, that moment. And then he rebuked it in the name of Jesus. And then just after that, one of his neighbors come up and is like, hey, do you want one? Talk about spiritual warfare. Talk about like you being attacked by the devil. Like right after you rebuked that, someone's like, hey. And he had to call upon the name of the Lord and says, I, Jesus saved me from that. Sin is deceitful. And it kills. This culture wishes to kill you morally. This culture wishes to kill you spiritually. And listen, your bodies, unfortunately, will kill you physically. Amen. And so we face death at every level. Morally, spiritually, physically. And those who have rejected God's Holy Spirit, they experience a whole other level of death. And that is eternal death. But a separation from God. Now, I have good news. Christ Jesus saves you from death. You see, death doesn't touch a Christian. Just the shadow of it. But it has no claim over you. You are alive in Christ Jesus. Forever. The new man wants to live and breathe. And be as he is. Because this world, we're born with a broken image. Jesus Christ has come to restore that image. That means this. Remember in the Garden of Eden when Adam was just walking and talking with God? Now you can walk and talk with God as Adam did. It's extraordinary. Because you're a new creature. You have truth in the Spirit. And so this is the application here. He saved us from darkness and death. He's given us new life. But look at these things that will result because of this new life. Look at verse 25. I love it. It says, therefore, putting away what? Lying. How many of you have never lied? No, <laughs> right? If one of y'all lifted your hand, you would have failed right there. Right? Amen. It doesn't matter who you are, right? It says, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth to his neighbor. For we are members of one another. It says, be angry and do not what? Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. This is so important, Christians. Because Christ has renewed us and changed us, how we used to live and how we used to deal with problems, we can't do that anymore. Amen? Do you all remember how you used to deal with problems before Jesus? And some of you guys are like, yeah, I remember when I used to deal with problems, right? Listen. You can't do that no more. Because Christ Jesus has changed you from the inside out. He wants you to handle it on a whole different level. It's called love. Amen? Love and truth. Love and passion. Love and forgiveness. And so Christ Jesus wants us to speak to one another in love and in truth and in mercy. How many of you have ever heard someone saying, well, I'm just trying to be real? But sometimes that doesn't come across from a place of love. Amen. It might come from a place of truth, but not love. Amen. You got to have both of those, truth and love. Aren't you so glad that Jesus gives us truth and love? That's so important. You see, if we don't communicate in a proper manner, we could become angry with one another. Amen. And listen, undealt with anger grows into wrath. And wrath can become very sinful and hurtful for all those involved. But here's the thing. We like to give room for the devil to work. And so we'll say things like this and phrases like this. Uh, have you ever heard someone say this? I'm fine. Oh, that's okay. Oh, I'm okay. 
Uh, I had a guy call me and he said, Pastor, I need your help. My marriage is in trouble and I, I just need you to call my wife and talk to her for me. And I was, <laughs> it's bad when you need your preacher to like call your wife and talk to her, you know. And so I was like, well, what did you do, you know? He's like, well, Pastor, you know, it was our anniversary and I thought to surprise her, me and the guys would go to Myrtle Beach and I was going to get a tattoo of our wedding date and our children's birth dates and all that. And then I was going to, you know, celebrate our anniversary. And I, I was just listening going, oh, man. This guy's kind of dug a really deep grave. And, but he didn't realize it, though. He didn't know how it sounded. I was like, so let me get this straight. You want to go to Myrtle Beach with your, your, your friends on your anniversary. Like, celebrating the day that you and your wife got married. You want to separate from your wife and go with your friends and, and, and get expensive tattoos. To celebrate her. And you're not spending any time with her. Oh, okay, Pastor. <laughs> I, I see what you're saying. And I was like, well, well, don't do it. It was, I've already done it, though. You see, she told me, do what I want to. And Pastor Chris, whenever someone, your wife ever tells you to do what you want to, don't ever do what you want to. <laughs> And I was like, that is just so much wisdom. But you see, he didn't want that wisdom before that happened. And to be honest, he was still stuck in an old mindset that needed to die. You see, it says in 1 Corinthians 13 that when I was a child, I put away childish things. And now, behold, amen, I'm an adult. Faith, love hope. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Love is the greatest. And when you love somebody, you'll put them ahead of yourself. And when you love Jesus, you'll put him ahead of yourself. Amen. This is love. We have to be good communicators. If you're upset or angry or dis uh, disenchanted, you need to talk about it or to grow into bitterness and the devil will have room to use it. And then it says in verse 20, Let him who stole steal no longer. Let him rather labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to those in need. You no longer have to take any more. You can give because Christ has made you a new creation. It says in verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What is good for necessary edification that you may impart what? Grace to the hearers. All right, church. I know this is weird, but Christians probably should be nice sometimes. Amen? We probably should find it very easy to speak in a positive manner. And this word, as it says here, let no corrupt word, or you could also say, let no wicked, worthless, rotten, unwholesome word depart from your lips. Words that tear down. Words that hurt. Words that cause bitterness and disunity. These are the words that he's talking about. Amen? And there's so many useful things that we can do with these mouths that God has given us. As James wrote in his letter, with our mouths we bless the Lord and Father and with it we curse those whom he has made in his image. Amen? And so listen, there's really a lot of things we can do with this thing that God has given us. Number one is pray. We can use our mouths to pray. We can use our mouths to encourage one another. Amen. We can be appreciative. When someone does something for us, we can say this, that's it. No, don't say that. We're to say, thank you. We can edify and build up others who are going through tough times. We can hold each other accountable, but listen, Approach them in a spirit of love and not a spirit of judgment. Amen? We can sing with our mouths. Amen? Now listen, some of us, are, our singing sounds different. Amen? But it's all a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen? We can use our mouths to sing. We can use our mouths to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, married people, stop criticizing each other and just start kissing more. Right? I know all of you guys are like, oh, that's a good idea, Pastor. 
Some of us, like, and if still your mouth still makes you stumble, just eat a snack. Just put something in there, guys. But it might not be your mouth. It might be your heart. Because from the heart flows what comes out of the mouth. And listen, Christ Jesus wants to take that heart and give you a brand new heart. I'll just end with a story. I love history. And uh, there was a, a pastor, and his name was a Peter Miller, Pastor Peter Miller. He changed the denominations in his ministry, but the denomination he was a part of, he had a church member, his name was Michael Whitman. Now these are in the days of uh, General George Washington, right, uh, around the Re Revolutionary War. He had a church member named Michael, and Michael gave him the hardest time when he was preaching. He would make loud, obnoxious sounds sometimes, or clear his throat really loud. <laughs> this is all those years ago, right? And, uh, and sometimes he would uh, correct the pastor if he made a stumble or something. So when the pastor switched denominations, he took even greater offense at this pastor. And he began to, if you ever saw him in town, would ridicule him, would talk about him. Once he even spat in this pastor's face. Now, Michael had a problem. He was wealthy. He owned a few taverns and a few inns. And one night when he was at the tavern, just talking it up with his friends... There were some people from the army there, overheard him, reported him, and he was arrested as a traitor and a spy for England. And they marched him off. They were going to hang him. When this pastor found out, he walked 60 miles. Now listen, now if you had this guy give you problems for years, ridicule you, talk about you, talk about your family, spit in your face, Many of us wouldn't travel 60 miles, but maybe just to watch what happens. But you see, this pastor had a personal relationship with General George Washington. He walked up to George Washington and said, Sir, I wish to ask for this man's freedom. And he said, I cannot give you your friend's freedom. And he said, Friend, this is my enemy. He's ridiculed me. He's hurt my family. He's hurt my ministry. He spat in my face. But I will stand before you today and say that even though he's all those things, he's not a traitor. And George Washington said, well, this I will agree upon. And he set him free. And so this pastor rode home in a wagon with his old enemy, but now his friend. I don't know where you're at with your walk. But Christ Jesus wants you to be with him, fighting a good fight. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can love you and allow you to pour into our lives and into our hearts. And Christ Jesus, when times of faith are hard, let us carry in our hearts the death of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be made known to everyone who sees us. Because you are not a God that is dead. You are a God who is alive and that you've called us to bring your light wherever we can. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.